Hello everyone, it's, uh, it's Phil Rogers here. I know this is really crazy times and my exhibition has been affected and we're now going online and through the Goldmark TV channel rather than the usual exhibition format. Everybody at the gallery are working really hard to put it together. I've been putting pots aside now for more than two years for this exhibition, so it's really disappointing not to be able to come and see the pots in the gallery and to meet everybody. I know that everybody at the gallery is working really hard to make this work with the online TV and different online chats. One exciting feature that the gallery is putting together is uh, an online interview between myself and the Reverend Richard Coles. I know that most of you will be familiar with Richard. He's on the television quite a lot. I Got News For You and QI and all of these programs that he does. So I'm really looking forward to that. He's, he's got a few pots of mine in his collection. And I know that he's a, a great sort of um, enthusiast for, for British studio pottery. So he'll have a lot of interesting things to say. I hope that you'll tune in. And I look forward to hearing some of your reactions to the pots. And we actually meet up in person fairly soon. I'm sure this is all going to be over one day and we'll all get back to a kind of new normal, which won't be quite like it's always been, but we'll see you soon. Welcome back to the Goldmark Gallery for today's broadcast. Uh, we've got a very special set of pots here in front of me today. We're going to be looking at the Japanese tea ceremony. As a quick disclaimer, I am not uh, practiced in the tea ceremony. I have no uh, proper knowledge of it. I, I, I uh, have only had experience with the pots that have come through the gallery. So you are going to be learning it afresh with me. And um, if there are uh, proper tea ceremony aficionados out there who can help us out, who can, who can help me learn some more about this, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, so do please send in any comments, any, any questions, any um, corrections as well. <laughs> The tea ceremony is known in, in Japan as uh, cha no yu or chado. Uh, it translates roughly as uh, the way of tea. And there's a bit of a hint in that name. Like so much of Japanese culture, um, the tea ceremony is not just the, the ceremony itself, the ritual of drinking tea, of, of communing with people and, and um, and uh, the, the sort of the performative element of it, it reaches much further back, much deeper into the, the spiritual, uh, the religious, the political roots of Japan, uh, like so much of, of, of Japanese culture, so many uh, Japanese institutions and sports. Today we're going to have a little look at some of the, the different parts that are involved in the tea ceremony, um, a, a bit of the history behind it, where uh, this, uh, this sort of strange phenomenon arose from. And then we're going to go through the very basic motions of a, of a tea ceremony um, with a few elements missing. Uh, we've been slightly limited in what we can deal with today. Um, I hope you learn something. I hope you enjoy something. Most of all, I hope uh, you enjoy these beautiful parts that are in front of me. Really, the origins of the tea ceremony uh, begin with uh, Japanese monks in the 9th and 10th century. At the time, those monks were travelling to Korea and to, to China, and uh, when they went to China, they brought back with them uh, both the practice of drinking tea, but also the tea itself, and tea bowls. Bowls not entirely unlike this one I've got here in front of me by Sven Beyer. These were often uh, very, very basic, very simple forms. Uh, it, rustic, um, made with this tomoku glaze. It's thought the name tomoku comes from the, the Chinese mountain Tianmu, where these monks uh, went and visited uh, the, the temples there, the Chinese temples, and where uh, bowls like this were produced for drinking tea during, during ceremonies. Those Japanese monks not only brought back the bowls 
and the seeds for the green tea where they, where they uh, first planted them in Japan. In fact, there's a, a famous temple in, in Kyoto where it's thought the first green tea was grown in Japan, brought back from, from China. Uh, and there's a, a, a celebratory uh, a ritual of picking the first leaves there uh, every season. Not only did they bring back the bowls and the tea, but they also brought back with them elements of Chinese Taoist and, and Zen Buddhist philosophy. That gives you a little idea of how um, philosophy, ways of thinking, ways of living are tied up, are bound intimately with the tea ceremony uh, and with the wares that they used. For some 200, 300 years, simple rustic bowls like this were the preferred option for, for masters who were uh, Japanese monks who would uh, uh, develop uh, the practice of drinking tea. As it became more and more fashionable to do so, it became not just monks who were drinking tea, but uh, all walks of life. And the longer it went on for, the more tea tasting, tea making, uh, and tea ceremonies of an early kind became important to uh, the wealthy and the elite. It was a way of showing off their collections of uh, beautiful uh, uh, ancient bowls uh, of tea wares that they built over the years. And it became a, a very important way of, of um, engaging in socialising amongst the elite, amongst the aristocratic, uh, and dealing with the diplomacy of, of talking to other members of that, that class. By the 1500s, uh, something looking much like the tea ceremony that we see today uh, had emerged, uh, and it was tied intimately with the politics of the time. Warring clans, warring warlords, the daimyo uh, warlords of, of, uh, of the uh, 1500s in Japan would make displays of their wealth, of their dominance, uh, of their, their superior taste by inviting people to their, to their, um, their castles and, and, and putting on ceremonies. This was a time of extraordinary violence uh, uh, and violent change in Japan. Um, two warlords in particular were uh, noted for, for, their, um, for their links to the tea ceremony. The first was Oda Nobunaga. He was responsible for driving out the shogun, the Ashikaga shogun, in the 1500s from his castle in Kyoto, taking over and ushering in a, a new and very bloody uh, period of, of attempts at reunification, of, of unifying the warring clans of, of Japan. Nobunaga was assassinated and it was left to his successor, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, to, to take over. Both these warlords were um, patrons of a very famous uh, tea master called Sen no Rikyu. Rikyu was um, really the figure uh, from whom we get today's tea ceremony. In the past, it had much been about opulence, about displays of wealth, about showing off your, your collection as a, as, a, as, a, as a wealthy member of the, of the aristocracy. Rikyu revitalised what the tea ceremony was all about. He made it about rustic simplicity, it was much simplified, the, the, the spaces within which it, it took place were very sort of ordinary sheds in gardens, hermitages, and it brought most importantly to the ceremony the c core concepts of what is uh, known today as wabi-sabi. Rikyu was not responsible for wabi-sabi, it did not originate with him, but he was really, of all the tea masters, the one who, who uh, popularised it in the tea ceremony. The wabi and the sabi really represent two separate elements uh, that combined um, talk about the, 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 the harmony of uh, accepting um, the transience of, of the world. Um, wabi represents sort of the, the internal, um, the immaterial, the spiritual feelings of isolation and, and humility uh, and, uh, and loneliness in, in the wilderness. Sabi is more the external, the material, and the effects of the world on material things. Decay, uh, the weathering, and, and, and worn surfaces of, of the material world. Wabi-sabi is really a philosophy that combines those two things. 
and it boils down to, to a, a, a simple idea, which is that um, nothing is complete, nothing is perfect, and nothing lasts forever. The tea ceremony under Rick Hugh, uh, was supposed to embody that feeling. And as you'll see a little bit later as we go through and, and look at some of the different parts, you can see how the, the works that we've got here um, and the way that we set, set those up um, are all bound with those ideas, those ideas of, of um, natural impermanence, of decay, of rough edges and textures. Wabi-sabi delights in the asymmetrical and um, the shadowed and the, the imperfect. And that's what we're going to see in some of these beautiful pots in front of me. That tea master, Sen no Rikyu, came to a fairly sticky end. His uh, patron, Hideyoshi, uh, the new man in charge, uh, and he shared very different feelings about what the tea ceremony could be. Rikyu maintained that it was supposed to be rustic, that there was supposed to be a simplicity to it. And Hideyoshi saw the opportunity for, um, for uh, boasting about his, his, his opulence uh, and about um, bringing some, some, some light, uh, uh, some, uh, some uh, showiness to the ceremony. Eventually, uh, Hideyoshi got so fed up with Rikyu that uh, he had one of his disciples brutally executed and demanded that Rikyu commit seppuku, which he did. That little story just highlights some of the, um, the contrasts and the tensions that are inherent in the tea ceremony, and in particular, in making chawan. The chawan is the tea bowl around which the ceremony revolves. It's the central part of the tea ceremony. And it remains, um, for Japanese potters, but also for, for potters internationally now, one of the great challenges in pottery. As you can see, chawan have come a long way from the sort of basic, rustic simplicity of a bowl like this to something like the magnificent gold lustre in this Shino glaze from Ken Matsuzaki on this chawan. Making chawan requires uh, a difficult balancing act for the potter. There are certain strict sort of, um, not, not quite regulations, but, but um, parameters within which chawan is supposed to, to operate. Uh, to be practical, um, tea masters are looking at a number of uh, different areas on the chawan. The rim has to be smooth enough that it can be wiped clean and not snag on, on, someone's, uh, on someone's lip. There has to be enough room within it for the tea to be whisked. And the surface on the inside has to be smooth enough that it's not going to break the whisk as that happens. There's got to be a body to the pot that has to be uh, within a certain thickness. If it's too thin, the tea will quite quickly cool down. If it's too thick, the bowl will feel clumsy and unwieldy. And then almost the most important part of a tea bowl is the foot, or the kodai. There are a number of different ways that all of these different parts of a bowl can be finished. But the kodai remains one of the most important. In particular, when potters sometimes trim the inside of the foot, you're left with a little spike that's called a, a helmet foot. That spike has to be softened. If you don't, and the pot is fired, you have this sharp point, and when someone takes the bowl in their fingers, you can spike them on the finger. Every aspect of the tea ceremony is reciprocal. It's about respect for one another, and every aspect of its movements, its orchestration, and the pots within it uh, is thought about in terms of that, that being able to, to, to be used, to be handled. So Chawan have very strict parameters in order for them to be usable. But in addition to that, Chawan uh, offers the potter a moment to uh, express himself or herself, to um, encapsulate their essence as a potter, without which the tea ceremony would be a fairly boring place. 
part of the tea ceremony is in uh, admiring and using and looking over the pots that, that are, are in use, uh, admiring the different ways that they've been formed, the different textures, the different colours. And the pots will be picked uh, together with the utensils, um, and with the, uh, a hanging scroll painting and a, and a, and a vase with, with flowers or a plate with flowers, um, all um, to reflect a, a certain feeling or a mood or, or a season. Um, the tea ceremony is intimately connected to the seasons and, and holidays in Japan. So in front of me here, I've got a number of different chawan. It's not surprising that within that challenge to a potter of condensing yourself to a single simple bowl, the, the simplest form there is in ceramics really, that making chawan has become not just a, a thing in Japan but, but internationally. So among these mostly Japanese bowls that we have here, I've managed to sneak in some tea bowls by Lisa Hammond. This is a lovely, slightly more open-topped tea bowl. Flatter and more open bowls like this are called Natsu tea bowls or summer tea bowls. And then just here, I've managed to sneak from upstairs from our new Phil Rogers exhibition. There'll be more news on that coming soon a Phil Rogers chawan. You can see this is a very different pot to some of the chawan that I've got below me here. But in many ways it's drawing on the same proportions, the same use, the same parameters, yeah. and the same sense of trying to capture the essence of, of, of one's pottery. It's got this lovely incised decoration here, which reflects the sort of the wheat and the, and the, the grass fields near where Phil lives in, in Wales, in this beautiful ash glaze. The next pot that's involved in the tea ceremony is the, the tea jar, or the cha ire. Now, um, sometimes these can be uh, of lacquer. Uh, in fact, I've got a really lovely example here. This is a very old lacquer tea jar from the collection of Mike Goldmark himself, with this beautiful decoration around the edge, you can see the grain of the wood as well. You can see it's been well used too. Typically a, a tea jar made from, from lacquer is called a, a natsume, I think. But these are a cha era, uh, ceramics tea jars, and these are these lovely faceted forms by Lisa Hammond. So in here, you'd find your powder, powdered uh, matcha yeah. and with a scoop, you can scoop out. You also sometimes get um, yes. little boxes in which you can have your matcha served. So this is what should be, a, this is normally a, an incense box that Lisa makes. But we could easily have some chawa, some, uh, some matcha in there too. So another integral pot to the tea ceremony is the mizusashi. Uh, these are water containers. Normally what you would have is a, 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 one of these filled with water and then a, a brazier with maybe some coals and a big metal kettle or an iron kettle. And you would ladle your water using a lovely bamboo ladle like this into your brazier so that it can warm as you uh, put your matcha in the chawan and then ladle the water from your brazier to the chawan to mix your tea. I've got a couple of mizuzashi here by a very famous potter. These are Shoji Hamada. This and this pot here. And these are both from the collection of, of Mike Goldmark. Uh, Hamada was uh, the potter who put Mashiko on the map really in terms of pot making um, and his, his potter remains the most uh, famous there of the 300 or so kilns that are, that are firing there uh, every year. But the rest of the pots on this table are by Ken Matsuzaki. 
Matsuzaki has a very direct, uh, direct uh, connection to, to Hamada. He was um, tutored by uh, an apprentice to uh, Tatsuzo Shimoka, who was Hamada's favorite apprentice. But if you look at the work that we've got here, it's completely different to anything that you would find in, in, in either Hamada's work or in Mashiko. And you can see the embodiment of that wabi-sabi aesthetic, that wabi-sabi philosophy, which I talked about earlier. Often it's a term that's used by people um, for anything that's slightly irregular, anything that's slightly wonky. As I discussed, it's, it, there's much more um, intellectual and philosophical uh, depth to it. In particular, among these pots, we've got these beautiful aribe uh, mitsuzashi, which almost have, sort of look like um, lotus flower designs. If you look at the shape across this lid, in this beautiful copper green glaze. This Ariba, uh, Ariba uh, style is actually named after one of those many warlords I talked about earlier from the 1500s, Furuta uh, Ariba. Those warlords would often afford their potters um, personal protection uh, and, and uh, collaborate with them in, in terms of um, commissioning new pots of the tea ceremony to sort of um, forward uh, the different styles used in, in various ceremonies. And, and in this particular case, Ariba gave his name to that very style. Here you can see another version. This has got sort of very typical iron brushwork across it. It makes for a lovely comparison with the, or contrast with, the, with this luscious sort of green color. But in particular, that wabi-sabi sense of, of um, uh, transience of imperfection, of um, irregular surfaces and, and, and uh, the detail of, of things that look like decay. You can get that in uh, these beautiful wood-fired pots. Um, the surface qualities that you get in a very long protracted firing like Matsuzaki's offer exactly the sort of incrustations and, and variations in the surface and a sort of very quiet decoration that perfectly complements the tea ceremony. What we're going to do now is we're going to, um, in the spirit of the, the very minimal tea ceremony, we're going to pick uh, a, a pot of each kind. Um, we're going to run through a very sort of basic uh, idea of what the tea ceremony would look like uh, and um, hopefully give you an idea of what this sort of, this ritual is all about. So the tea ceremony can vary wildly in terms of how formal, uh, how prolonged it is. Today we're going to look at the very, very basic form. Um, typically you would have a, a special room in a house or uh, maybe an outhouse in the garden where this would take place. And normally there'd be um, a small uh, alcove somewhere where you would have a hanging scroll painting uh, and some flowers in a vase or in a, in a small dish. We haven't got that, so instead um, we've put a vase up here behind me. I think this lovely round golden surface sort of reflective of the sunshine that's come out that we're all trying to enjoy in whatever way we can so that's going to be our, our theme today. Um, and then uh, in the place of a scroll painting we've got this mirror print above me which is sort of calligraphic in its quality. Normally the floor would be covered in tatami mats and uh, each guest would enter the room uh, from a particular entrance, uh, slightly low so that everyone has to bow. The idea is that everyone who's entering this space is, is um, submitting to a, 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 a neutral space, a spiritual space, um, where humility is shown at every, every stage. So everyone has to stoop as they come through into the main room. Once everyone is there and they've admired the alcove with its 
painting and its, its vase, uh, the host would then come in and start to prepare their utensils. You can see I've got some of those out here in front of me. Um, as an example, this is a little matcha whisk. It's again been made of bamboo. This is it before it's been warmed up. You can see all these little prongs are all sort of curling in. I've got another one here that's been warmed in hot water. You can see those have all opened out so that this whisk is ready for making the tea in this bowl. I had a hard time choosing a chowan from all those lovely tea bowls that we had out earlier. Uh, I've got a, a number of different examples. Um, the different shapes uh, in uh, chowan uh, have different sort of significances, different meanings uh, and different names as well. We've got one here which is much more squashed in. This is by Koichiro Isezaka. Normally this sort of um, squashed in shape is, is called a shoe shape. This is a bit of a variation on that type. There are lots of other different shapes, like um, there are those named after certain things like uh, Go stones in the, in the game Go, uh, the Chinese sort of chess-like game. Some as tea bowls, as we saw earlier. And then down to the potter, entirely different forms. So this is a very heavily fluted tea bowl, again by Koichiro. This is entirely unlike anything you would find from the tea ceremony 500 years ago. Or something much more rounded, like this beautiful Iga style tea bowl by Kazuya Furutani. It's got this lovely ash glaze decoration around it. I thought we'd go with something slightly more traditional though. So we have here this beautiful Shino tea bowl by Kemetsuzaki, again with this lovely motif design on the front. And again, this lovely gold luster to connect with that big sun that we have behind me. As everyone's seated, ready to, to drink their tea, um, the host would then typically offer uh, her guests or his guests um, a, a little sweet to eat to sweeten the palate so it's ready for the matcha. Um, I've got here some little plates. These are lacquer plates. These are made by Ken Matsuzaki's brother. And again, these are from the collection of uh, from Mike Goldmark. So you'd receive a little sweet like this just to sweeten the palate, ready for the, for the matcha tea, to get all the different flavours out of it. And then we're ready to make some tea. Normally there'd be a big uh, iron kettle with a brazier here, and we'd start by uh, warming some water. So we would have our water carrier, probably with the lid already off. Scooped out with this bamboo ladle and taken to our kettle, which would be here. That would then be rested on the brazier. We haven't got that, so I'm going to rest it here on the mizuzashi. Every movement in the tea ceremony, unlike what I'm doing right now, is highly orchestrated. It's highly complex in its movements. That tea master we talked about earlier, Sen no Rikyu, famously said uh, that uh, the tea ceremony is simply preparing matcha, uh, preparing hot water and making tea. In reality, it's much more complex than that. And as a way of life, as the way of tea, cha no yu, um, some masters will spend their whole lives uh, perfecting this, this ceremony, uh, uh, enjoying the different aspects of it, the different elements of putting together a, a performance and, a, and a, a space for people. That ties in, again, to that wabi-sabi philosophy. Tea ceremony is never complete. One tea ceremony can never be reproduced. It's an ongoing process. The tea master's journey is never over. So we've got our water warming and our brazier. 
it's time to get some matcha into this tea bowl. So I've got my tea jar here. You can see that beautiful bright green colour on this bamboo spoon. That's going to go in our tea bowl. And then again, there'll be a, a series of movements for getting the tea off this spoon, maybe tapping against the side of the bowl. It's very orchestrated, very meticulously done. Then we would take our water from the brazier, from the brazier, and into the chawan, probably a couple of scoops. And again, this would be laid to rest. And then this is vigorously whisked using one of these bamboo whisks. I haven't got the water here to do that. Um, but we'd end up with a beautiful, bright green coloured liquid. There's actually not very much tea made during this, this ceremony. This is all about tasting, about um, reciprocity, about sharing a, a very special moment, uh, more so than about, uh, about uh, maybe um, quenching your thirst. The tea bowl would then be offered from the host to a guest with its best side facing forward. I'd say that's probably this motif here. Often a chawan is designed with a sort of front face, a, a face that has a, a decoration on it or a side that's particularly intriguing. That's offered from the, the host to the guest so that they can enjoy that front face. The guest then excuses themselves for going first amongst the other, other guests and then will turn the bowl to enjoy that face and will then turn it away so that the front face is facing away so that other people can enjoy it while they're taking their sip. They would then uh, take the time having had their tea to sit and turn and look at the bowl and this is where that element of, of um, contemplation and uh, pottery and appreciation for crafts and skill and art and beauty all come together handling of the pottery and, and enjoying its different surfaces, its different qualities, the mood that's been, uh, the atmosphere that's been built in this, in this ceremony based on the different pots that have been chosen, the different tensions and contrasts or complements between them. This is what it's all about. The tea ceremony is really the antithesis of our everyday living today, our, our daily existence today. It's slow, it's tactile, it's analog, it's a, it's a sort of, um, it's a cure for the, the hastiness, the busyness, the, the, the sort of, um, the chaos of much of, of everyday living. And it's no wonder really that in the last hundred years or so, as the joy of using handmade ceramics has grown, uh, particularly outside of Japan and in the West, so has an appreciation for what the tea ceremony and the pots within the tea ceremony can bring you. I hope you've enjoyed today's introduction to the tea ceremony, to the pots involved. Um, apologies for my, uh, my amateur explanations for things and, and for, for showing you um, what the ritual involves. Um, if there's anybody out there who practices tea ceremony regularly um, and has pots to show us, do please get in touch, send us some photos, send us some footage of you um, uh, of doing it. It would be lovely to see other people uh, enjoying uh, the different pots that are involved in this. Um, and as always, everything that you've seen today, all, all, the, all the pots that we've gone through, all the, the beautiful chow and the mizuzashi, uh, those are all available on our website, so do please go and have a look. You can see some of those in more detail. We've not been able to catch them here today. I look forward to bringing you more pot goodness as, as, the, as the weeks go by. We've got our Phil Rogers exhibition coming up very soon. Um, I've seen the pots out upstairs and they are looking absolutely astonishing. I'm really looking forward to be able to walk through that exhibition and, and show you some of those pots. And I believe we have the Reverend Richard Coles uh, who's going to be talking to Phil personally about some of those pots in the exhibition and, and his preparation for them. So that's a broadcast not to miss. We'll let you know the dates of that soon. 
In the meantime, keep enjoying Goldmark TV and I hope to see you again soon. to uh, uh, educate, entertain our customers. OK, so now we're going to look at some other of his prints. We're thinking very seriously about stopping making pots. But there's nothing forced. And I think his jugs are, are really the epitome of that. Hello, welcome to today's broadcast from the Goldmark Gallery. One of my most regular places to visit up in this part of the world is the Goldmark Gallery.